Uh, we're here speaking today with uh, State Senator Stuart Greenleaf, uh, who first served in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 1977 and 1978, representing the 152nd District, which covered parts of Bucks and Montgomery counties, and has been a state senator from 1979 to the present, yes. uh, representing the 12th Senatorial District, which also covers parts of Bucks and Montgomery counties. Uh, sir, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us today. Thank you for allowing me to come. Um, First, I want to, before we dive into your legislative career and accomplishments, I want you to go back a little bit and talk about uh, your, your childhood and growing up, uh, where you grew up, where you went to school, that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, my family's lived in, um, in the Philadelphia area for many years, and, um, and uh, my grandfather and father uh, moved and lived in um, Montgomery County in Willow Grove, Upper Moreland Township. And, um, so that's where I grew up and uh, went through the public schools there. And um, I always um, was very interested in athletics and, and um, as any, I guess, young, young boy is. And, um, and played all, all, all kinds of sports there. And, uh, and then went to college in, in, the, in the area, went to University of Pennsylvania. And, Played basketball there. I was always, I always had the aspiration of becoming a professional basketball player. Actually, right. um, I wasn't involved in politics or interested in politics at all. Um, but I never made it. But I was always you know, interested in uh, in that. So, uh, um, and then went to uh, went, then went to law school. Decided to, if I'm not going to be a professional basketball player, I'm as well go to law school. <laughs> so which I which I did. Had second career. Yeah. And. Um, <clears throat> And then after graduation, took some positions, um, like being a law clerk to a judge and, and then being an assistant district attorney. And I was a public defender for about a year and then assistant district attorney for about seven years. And um, that was the first time I was ever exposed to um, my public officials and the decision making process. And, I don't know, I've always had a, at least during that period, developed a, a sense of what's, what is right and just and what it wasn't. And when you're involved in that profession, you see many public officials and are exposed to them in different ways, either practicing before them or, or interacting with them. And I saw the abuse of power there in both my local and county situations. And that uh, just has, it, it um, concerned me, to say the least. And that's when I got interested in politics to try to change that, to have, see that, make sure that the fair thing is done. We all have an innate feeling about that. We all have an innate sense of what's, even children have an innate feeling about what's, uh, you know, to be taught this, what's fair and what's just and what isn't, and whether you're being treated unjustly or not. And I feel that way both, both by myself and also with people, uh, other people in different situations. That's the reason I got involved in politics, because I, because I was never interested in politics at all. I was really not exposed to it at, at all. Uh, I think my, my my uncle who lived in the community and my father were maybe a school board member or something like that, but I wasn't really that aware of that. And, and all. So, um, so that was the reason for it and ran for local office, was a township commissioner for four years and then, um, and then the House, House of Representatives seat um, yeah, what motivated you? Up. What motivated you to run for that, from a local t local government to running for the state office? Because I saw another opportunity to try to kind of right wrong, right wrongs uh, in another another um, level of government, a broader level of government. And I had I not had much interaction with with uh, legislators at all. Um, just brief. And I had not, well, obviously I've been to Harrisburg, but had not been to the chamber or, um, and, um, 
had not visited Harrisburg or anything like that. I just saw it as an opportunity to right wrongs, to do justice. And, and that's, that's um, so I ran for the House member, was retiring, and I um, ran for that office and was elected to the 152nd Legislative uh, District, the House District. And um, well, how was campaigning then? Uh, since you never, I mean, you you ran for office on a local level. How was the the change to actually running for a state office? Uh, it was the same, but it was obviously in, in different in that you were running for a larger office with a lot more people. Uh, when I was when I was a lo in local government, it was one ward that I ran in. Right. But I learned lessons there and. Um, and I also learned about um, going out and talking to people and reaching out to them, like knocking on doors and canvassing. And I start that when I ran for township commissioner. Okay. And um, so you had a little bit of name recognition. People already knew you. Some groups already knew who you were. Right. And part. they knew my family. My okay. family had been in the community for a long time. Um, but it wasn't always an easy walk. I mean, right. people think that these things just fall in your in your lap, or they or they're easy to obtain, and then when you get them, that they're they're kind of glamorous type of positions. They're not. They're just really hard grunt work, mm -hmm. and you're going to work hard. But if you enjoy what you're doing, uh, then it's okay. I mean, and uh, so it is. It's campaigning is hard. You know work and and so is being a legislator any so, any more difficult running for a senate campaigning for a senate seat with a even still a larger district it's the same process mm -hmm. it's just it's just more people mm -hmm. that you have to cover and you have to use you have to use different techniques to reach out to those people to introduce yourself and to let them know what you're you're interested in and what you want to accomplish and when you're running an award Obviously, it's uh, it's it's a couple two polling dis uh, districts, um, so you can cover that pretty easily. And it's, but it's probably a good experience because if you all of a sudden you're pushed into a situation where you're in an area where you have to learn all these things real quick in a, in a few months, uh, it's probably was a good experience for me. I love being a township commissioner. I just. Uh, you had an opportunity to change things. I wanted to change things in in the uh, in the um, in the township. Uh, there was a lot of infighting and partisanism and dissent and uh, disarray in the township uh, administration and the building um, issues with um, the police chief and the, and the other administrators there. And uh, but one one of the things that it's very destructive is when public officials get involved in the actual work that the administration is supposed to do because they want to, you know, they're supposed to be administering them and advising them like as a board of director. When you get into riding around in police cars or, 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 or going around with the trash collectors, that's not really that good. I mean, it's good to know what they're doing, but not to try to be involved in everything because that's, that causes, I think, problems when people do that. You and brought up. Did you, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you brought up uh, the nature of partisanship, and I want to talk a little bit about that later. But uh, um, you're uh, elected as a Republican official. Uh, when did you uh, have a sense of uh, that you'd be a Republican? And has that sort of changed over the years? The the idea of party and what you're affiliated with. Right. I. I um, well, I grew up in a Republican home, and I, as time grew on, there was any question that I was going to be a Republican. I believed in the principles of the Republican Party, but I wasn't. But it wasn't. The party was a way of uh, the process of going to become a, a public official. So uh, it wasn't particularly that partisan. I mean, I. I mean, I was a Republican, and I and I thought it was loyal to my party, but not the impact, not to impact my how I voted. I mean, I voted because uh, I went out and tried to reach out to them door to door, 
and I really enjoyed it because they told you what they were interested in and um, they're happy to see you because they feel like they're isolated from their government so anything you can do to reach out to them encourages their confidence uh, in their government and confidence in, in you and actually I got a lot more out of it than they ever did um, because it gave me the the, um, the confidence that I was representing them because I heard from them. I got a lot of good ideas uh, from them, things that they wanted done, and I try to follow through on, on that. So that, and also to do the right thing, to do the just thing. And usually that was the thing that they were interested to. And if they weren't, they would come along if you explained to them what you were trying, what you were trying to do. Yeah. So it was the same process, but each, each office was accomplished in a different way. You could still knock on doors. And I've knocked on quite a few. <laughs> yeah, a couple hundred thousand doors or more over the years. Uh, because I'd, I'd go out on the weekends and I'd drive home from Harrisburg and knock on doors there, I'd knock on the doors on holidays, and so I, I did a lot of it. And it was, but it really gave me the confidence I needed to do my job up here because all I wanted was their support. Their, I didn't. It's it's more important to represent your constituents than represent anybody else, either in Harrisburg or in, or anyone else. Well, you, you brought up your house, your, your district that you represent. Uh, it might be helpful to do a comparison between your house and your Senate district. Right. One smaller than the other. But uh, uh, what's contained within your district uh, and what sort of makes them uh, particularly unique to, to your area? I've always represented two counties. The, uh, usually the majority of my district has been in Montgomery County, but there's always been maybe 25% of my district has been um, Bucks County. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed that because both po counties are great counties, they're wonderful people, they're very close to each other and uh, although, even though there's a county line there, they're really very, very similar in, in nature and, and uh, so I very, felt very comfortable with uh, representing, representing them. The 152nd Legislative District is um, still in my, in my uh, senatorial yeah. district. Yeah. All of it is. And in fact, um, all the communities I represented when I was a House member are still in my senatorial district. Now, they're not, some of them I've lost for a few, uh, a couple of years to, uh, during redistricting, mm -hmm. and then they've come back and they're putting back. So now, right now, the 12th senatorial district encompasses all the communities that I represented as a House member. Oh, wow. Uh, plus, of course, a lot, a lot more. Um, so it's the it's very similar in, in nature. It has changed a little bit because of redistricting. Uh, there have been legislative members from Philadelphia that have been put into Montgomery and Bucks counties because of yeah. loss of population and, and all. So rather than running along the border of Philadelphia, my district more goes up along County Line Road goes more west or north okay. instead of uh, more like east. Uh, so it's, but it's changed, it's changed, my district has changed over the years, but, but not a lot. Uh, the, large, the large percentage of the communities that I represent now, I've represented for years. Some of them, I would think maybe a third, are communities that I've represented when I was first elected as a state senator. Mm -hmm. So I've represented them for many years. What types of issues do they bring to you uh, on a consistent basis? What are, what are their concerns within the district? Yeah. It's, it's really kind of interesting is that um, there, the issues are many of them are the same. Mm -hmm. For example, property taxes. Oh, sure. <laughs> and, and that's a big issue now, too. And we've struggled with that in the, in the legislature, both in the House and the Senate, about how do we deal with that issue. And now we're dealing with it now. And yeah. I think we may have come up with a solution now. Um, so, but we've we passed different legislation like the senior uh, rebate program and and uh, the Homestead Act and and putting um, some regulations on the amount of um, 
around, amount of increase. A uh, school district can increase their budget uh, without going to a referendum. So it's an important issue, and, but it was, it was always been an important issue. And uh, if this, this the, the issue that we're dealing with now, the proposal we're dealing with now, may be the solution. And I'm very enthusiastic about it at this point and optimistic that we can work out all the details of it. What's um, some of the major uh, either industries or, uh, or what do the people within your district or demographics, what do they do uh, for a living? Uh, well, there, they, there's a variety. There's, a, there's a, many senior citizens, um, um, but there's young professionals. Um, we, it's a very diverse district and people think that the suburbs uh, are very wealthy and other people with very moderate incomes. There's some people that are wealthy, but also people that are struggling too. And um, so, you know, we have to be aware of that and to be concerned about that. Uh, the industries that are in my district, um, uh, pharmaceuticals are probably the largest. I have three pharmaceutical um, sites in my, in my uh, district. Um, some are very large, and, uh, and the people who work there um, are all my constituents. Mm. We have a large insurance company in my district, and then what's surprising is because I visit them, I get invitations from some of my businesses that I don't know about that ask me to come and visit their business, and I've done that, and it's really very, very fascinating what's there. Okay. You drive by them, and you don't know what's in those those they're large box warehouses, buildings. Yeah, yeah they like, look like warehouses. Yeah. But you walk in there, and they're doing all kinds of sophisticated things. So one company I walked into was a biotech company, hmm. and they were doing all kinds of really interesting, cutting-edge technology involving food and things. And uh, and then one one company I walked into. I did. I had no idea what it was, and uh, again, looking like it looked like a warehouse outside. It was a nice building, well maintained and all, but it looked like it was one of those big box buildings. It turned out they had a centrifuge that they were training uh, pilots and jet pilots uh, in how to draw, fly a plane. They had. I sat down and saw a. a, a, um, a console before me, like you were drawing, like you were flying a plane. I mean, and they do it all over the world. They have customers all over the world. In fact, most of their customers are in other countries. Hmm. Who would ever think that a, co that a company like that was there, or the, a biotech company like that, right. or all those? So it's uh, they have some really interesting businesses there and industry. You know, it's not heavy industry. Mm -hmm. It's all based on um, a lot of high tech uh, stuff. So I'm, I'm. It's a great district to represent the people are there they know what they're talking about they give me all kinds of ideas they let me know about things and i try to follow through on it uh, and when i go out and knock on doors uh, they tell me all kinds of things i always write things down uh, when they tell me that and follow up on it and so many of the bills i've introduced were um were the result of uh, knocking on a door or going out to an event and having them come up to me and tell me about it. And I look at it. Sometimes I don't. I, and maybe it's not such a great idea. Sometimes, a lot of times, it is though. And um, and uh, it's important to listen to your constituents. And that's sort of. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, there, that's sort of the other side of being a public official that a lot of people. Uh, don't understand or uh, they see the concept of you coming here and the lawmaking side of it but then there's the back home part and the district part where you're going to events you're knocking on doors uh, what's the the time comparison or the uh, comparison of make what what's the hardest for you to maintain the balance between those two actually they're almost two different worlds yeah. and people think that that all we do is work in Harrisburg and that's our job and we do nothing else but that. But that's how much it's changed though too. If we can compare when I first came up here, uh, we had offices, but we had an office that was, I think there was six or seven of us in one large room okay. with a desk. And I don't think we had, I'm not sure we had, each had an individual 
phone. I think we may have at that point. Mm -hmm. And we, ha we shared one secretary. And um, that was challenging um, because of the responsibilities you had and you had no real, it was hard to delegate to anyone because you didn't, you didn't have that support staff. And at the, t at the time, we didn't have, we, they were just starting with district offices. And I, I really wanted one as I thought that that's, that's where my constituents are and, and we're trying to service them. And there are two parts of this job. It's about 50-50. When we're up here, we're dealing with legislative issues and dealing with uh, the things that we do as legislators to make our Commonwealth better by passing reasonable, just laws. And that's what I try to do. But at home, it's all about taking care of your constituents and, and being their advocate. Uh, I am an attorney, and I, I, look, at, I look at that as um, they're a client and that I should be representing them as a legislator in the same, same function to solve their, their problems and to an, be an advocate for those issues that are, affects state government, but we'll also get involved in things where, where it affects them in their local government or, their, or the county um, or other things. Um, even if it's not related to government, we try to resolve issues with we'll help them and they're, if they need a, um, get their license, um, a replacement of their license or, or their operator's license or um, whatever, help them with their passport. Um, Solve, solve a problem they're having with the schools or with uh, the township or, or just solve problems. Sometimes we just try to solve their problems, their, their, their needs. We have people that come in that are homeless uh, just for a short period of time. Something how we try to help, we, we help them all the time. Uh, just uh, from very almost minor things like getting a copy of your license to life and death issues. We have involved in people that are trying to get them health care and, and direct them in the right way so that they can actually save their lives as their life is being threatened by a disease or a malady and they're not getting the right treatment. You know, we do that and so I try to have a good office and uh, they are responding to requests like that every day. You know, maybe a hundred tons or hundreds of times a day. We get emails now that are, we get maybe it's 100, 200 emails a day or more, um, and walk-ins and things like that. So that's, that's part of our job, and to, and to visit them and to talk to them and go to the events and because we want to support our community, help them out, and so that's what legislators do. All of us do that. Well, let's transition and talk about some of your time here in Harrisburg. Uh-huh. Uh, you said that uh, you were not politically involved from the start, and you said when you came to Harrisburg, you had no really working knowledge of how the system went. What was your first impression when you got here? Well, I mean, uh, we, we had the privilege of working in the most beautiful state capital in the nation. I mean, our Pennsylvania state capital is gorgeous. I've seen other state capitals, and they're nice, but there's no comparison. We couldn't afford or, or be allowed to build a, a, a building like this, <laughs> but we'd have it here, and we're and we're preserved it. And and when I was here, it was a little little rough around the edges. I'd say it's still beautiful, but um, that's one of the things I'm really pleased about. If you want to look, uh, talk about the the fiscal plan first, um, is that it is impressive building. Uh, but we formed a, a committee, the Capital Preservation Committee, and they've just, just done a wonderful, wonderful job of cleaning, cleaning it, taking all the, the decades of, uh, of smoke and, and soot and, uh, and uh, taking drop ceilings that, that, that um, concealed beautiful murals and paintings and, and so on. Um, uh, it's probably is uh, the best it's ever been. Maybe it's as good as it when it was when it was first built here, and it's changed a lot. And and of course, our working conditions have have improved because um, those offices are used to service our um, our constituents, 
and there's some serious problems that come into that office, not just talk about legislation. And we're, you know, they're, I, I call people who work in my office caseworkers because everyone that walks in there, they have a case, they have an issue, they have an, they have an issue that they, that's very, they come in stressed many times and in deep trouble. And um, so I, I just hire the best people I can and they're there every day while I'm up here uh, and helping my constituents. Um, so the, so we, we are, our, our assets as legislators have increased, but so is our effectiveness. I would not want to go back to the days where we had on, in no real office and no you know, real phone or, uh, and, 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 and I was just on the edge when they, we did have a, a district office, but just, they had just begun doing that. And I mean, they would have no place to go to reach out. Um, so all the, you'd sit in that office and watch who the people are coming in and what we're doing, and every legislator is doing. It's important. That's important work. We're helping people that need assistance. And we're making government more efficient because we're making them more accountable and putting them in the help, and trying to help them um, get to the right people. Coming in um, when you did your first House uh, stint, um, as a freshman legislator, what were your expectations about what you could get done or about how uh, the whole process ran? I didn't have any expectations. I was just very pleased that I was there, mm -hmm. that I was here. Um, not only because it was a nice building, but, 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 but that was only a side of uh, right. observation. Uh, the fact that I was going to be able to help people and establish what I wanted to do and that have, that have society be a just society. And if you look at my career, that, 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 um, that ribbon of justice has gone through my whole career. If you look at the things I've introduced and the issues that I'm in, interested in, it's all about justice. And, uh, and so it looks like, like I'm all over the place, but it's just where I feel justice leads me. And then I try to advocate for that. And sometimes it takes a long time I and mean, one of the things you have to have in the legislature is perseverance because it does, most of the time it doesn't change fast and it's not, it's not set up to be an institution that, that resolves things very quickly. In fact, it's supposed to be, in fact, there's two houses and one is even, they have two year sessions because they're, they're supposed to be more responsive to the people because they have to run every two years. And, and our, in our situation in the Senate, we run every four years. And uh, there's a purpose uh, for that. Uh, so it's important for us to, um, you know, to advocate for the things that we need in our legislature. But it's, but it's difficult to get a piece of legislation through because of that. And there's, many, there's, there's a large number of people in, the, in, in each body. You have to get a consensus. And it's, it's, a, very, it's, it's a department that has very significant powers. And um, it could be abused. I mean, we, we, we have the right to impeach, for example. So we have done that. I, I did serve on a, on a committee. I was the chairman of the committee on an impeachment of the Supreme Court justice. That's a tremendous power, tremendous responsibility. Um, so it should be diverse. So the power is diverse. It's not in one person and um, anticipated among those people. Or you're only in the House for one term, and then you ran for the second, right. what, the Senate. What was the circumstances that led you to uh, run from, right. from the House to the Senate? Well, I was, I was in the House, you're right, for two, for two years. And, um, and I was very active there. I was, uh, again, going door to door to P uh, while I was all during that two-year period and, and reaching out to my constituents in that, in that, uh, that uh, realm. And, um, and then the, um, and introduced legislation. I got, actually got two bills two passed. Bills passed. Uh, the As first a freshman two. legislator, that's pretty good. And so I, <laughs> uh, thank you, God, so it happened. <laughs> and, uh, um, and introduced legislation. I was on the Judiciary Committee and Crimes and Corrections and, and Labor Committees. Mm -hmm. And um, but then the Senate 
a position opened up and I thought that was another opportunity to expand my ability to do what I wanted to accomplish. Um, the the um, sitting senator had, uh, had a stroke and passed away and so that seat opened and I ran for it and it was a really knock down drag out battle. I mean every, every step of the way here is I think that people uh, just open the door and say, here it is. Sometimes that happens to people, but that's not with my case. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's okay because I learned a lot of lessons and it made me even more independent because, the, because what I did, I went, went back to and out to the, the people of my district and knocked on their doors. Uh, that's who I was um, uh, going to for support. And so it turned out to be a good thing for me so that it wasn't just handed to me. Although I had a lot of people, you don't do this by yourself and you don't get elected by yourself, you don't function as a legislator by yourself. It's all working with other legislators, working with your staff, working with your constituents, working with your, you know, with just everyone. You have to be able to do that, but you also have to be strong enough to stand on your own. You served as Chairman now of Judiciary Committee in the Senate for uh, uh, for a long while. Um, what's the importance of that role, and, and is it was that a position you sought out as uh, soon as you were elected to Senate, seeing that that's that's where your expertise has lined? Since I practiced law, I've been assistant district attorney for seven years. That uh, the my interest was the, to be the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And um, the first, actually the first committee that was offered when I was a freshman in the Senate was the, uh, right, there was two. One was the Veterans Affairs Committee and one was the Law and Justice Committee. Well, I thought the Law and Justice Committee was perfect for me because I could have, uh, I just spent seven years as a prosecutor and prosecuting murder cases and every other kind of case and, and taking appeals. I was also chief of the appeals division. So I knew a little bit about the criminal justice system. Um, so I had that choice. I said, well, law and justice, that's, that's what I want. Well, it, it turned out that the Law and Justice Committee had nothing to do with law or justice. Uh, it, was, it just dealt with the law, Liquor Control Board. Uh, now, I don't drink, so I, I don't have a lot of experience in that area, but I didn't know that. But um, uh, apparently they had stripped uh, all the functions of the liquor uh, the law and justice committee out of it a couple of years before I was elected for some reason political reason and maybe the chairman they're having trouble with the chairman I don't know what, what what the reason was but I didn't realize I should have checked into that <laughs> what the law and justice committee actually had in, in place so um, so that I was the chairman of the law and justice committee uh, for a couple of years and then the judiciary committee uh, opened up. I was on a, on a member of the Judiciary Committee and then a few years in, into my term uh, the, um, the Judiciary Committee chairmanship opened up and I was, uh, again, it was, a, it was a battle. There were a number of people who were interested in it, uh, but I was fortunate enough to be appointed to it. Okay, sometimes running internally is tougher than running externally. It is. <laughs> every, every, every election, whether it's 49 other senators or whether it's uh, uh, you know, 250,000 residents, uh, every election, how small or big it might be, it's still a, a tough, um, a tough uh, process. But it's the, it's the democratic process, and it should be that way. Nobody should be handed, you know, that you have to, hopefully that's why you get your most qualified people. Not always, but it's the best system that, that we, uh, mankind has to, to get the best individuals rather than pointing uh, somebody um, or electing someone without being vetted. That's basically what we're doing. So I've, yeah, I've been the chairman of the, um, of the Senate Judiciary Committee for uh, just under 30 years. And what does that role mean here in the House? Well, it's the, seen the, as a pretty powerful position. A lot of legislation runs through that, uh -huh. that committee. Um, how do you see that position? I looked at it as, as righting wrongs. I didn't look at it as a powerful position. I didn't know that a lot of bills went to that committee. I just knew that there were things that I saw that I wanted to correct and to do justice. And um, 
and actually I don't even even recognize that until years afterwards that our, that our committee was getting you know a lot of bills to it proportionately other than the appropriations committee right, sure. that gets to, at the second most I, I really didn't even pay attention to that um, but the first thing I did as a um, the chairman of that committee was to um, hold hearings on child abuse in the, in the early 80s uh, when all of ch sexual child abuse uh, all over the state holding hearings on that issue because I'd seen it uh, previously in the DA's office and in other, in other places and uh, thought that nothing was being done about it and really there was an awful lot being done about it. Now it's a, we're in a different world with that subject matter but then it was something that people thought well, it wasn't happening and if it was happening it wasn't important. Uh, it's hard to believe now but I held hearings and probably five or six hearings all over the state from the west to the east and, and also I know what they were saying and the, and, the, and the children who were abused I remember having some of them they were there in their late teens now and then saying that really they felt they were at fault you know they're the ones that what caused it uh, when really that's not that wasn't the case right. but the, the guilt was being put on them society was putting the guilt on them not on the perpetrator and in fact we have it's we've that's now it's happening now we're now dealing with one of the one of the other major issues that we've, we've dealt with a lot of that since then like uh, megan's law and uh changing the constitution allowing children to testify in closed cir circuit television and um, passing laws on child abuse and reporting and that sort of thing um, and protecting children um, but now we're dealing with a similar situation that is human trafficking yeah. and uh, we're about to pass legislation on that and deal with that issue and it's important for us to do that excuse me <coughs> And we're dealing with uh, human trafficking because it's, um, it's the same situation with child abuse. We were blaming the victims, not the perpetrators. And that's what we're doing with um, human trafficking now. We're blaming the victims and not the perpetrators. The perpetrators are the, are the um, sexual predators. They're the ones that are habitual sexual violent predators that are out there preying on children who are runaways. And within 48 hours, those children are picked up by um, these predators who are looking for them in shopping malls and other places that children would go, and, uh, and then taking advantage of them, and taking advantage of them for years, and abusing them, and, and, and exploiting them for money. <clears throat> and um, we need to recognize that they are the victims. They're not the perpetrators, the people who are the pimps and the exploiters and the other people engage in that type of activity. They're the ones that are, the, the, are not the victims, they're the perpetrators. So it's still going on. And we're still dealing with that issue. Uh, but we're going to deal with it very soon in Pennsylvania. Great. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, certainly a major theme uh, through your legislation is, uh, has been the crime issue. And you spent a lot of your early career um, making legislation, proposing legislation that was tough on crime. Mm. Um, now we sort of come to the other end of the spectrum. Uh, our corrections budget is, is one of our biggest line items in the, in the budget. Right. Uh, our, we're building new prisons, and I know that's something that you're concerned with. Where, at what point um, did you have the realization that, yes, we ought to be tough on crime, but now we also got to do something about uh, the, the overcrowding of prisons and, and that issue? Yeah, I, I came up here as uh, ex my experience of being, I was, I had s some experience on both sides, but the majority of my experience was as a prosecutor in the criminal justice system. And so the view then was to get tough on crime, uh, and that would create safer streets and uh, reduce crime and reduce violent, um, violent crime. And so what did we do? And I was and certainly one of the leaders of this was to pass more mandatory sentences, put more people in jail, 
um, you know, just get tough on everybody. Um, and that was, there, there was a portion of that that was, that was good. For example, that we were dealing with uh, sexual predators, for example. <clears throat> But we didn't anticipate the unintended consequences. There are some people that we need to take punitive actions against and to, and to incarcerate them because they are dangerous to society. But they're only a small percentage of the people engaged in criminal activity. What we were doing, though, was putting people who were not a danger to society and putting them in jail, too. The, 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 the most um, important and most um, causative factor in increasing the population of our prisons was the, the, the nonviolent offenders, misdemeanors. And that was an unintended consequence of getting tough on crime. Was, well, that was an, an unintended consequence of what we did. And I was, as I said, I was up there to do justice, not to do injustice. And we were doing unintentionally injustice. And on top of that, it was un, un, very ineffective and extremely expensive. Mm. Our prison population increased during that time from um, about 550 percent. Our prison population increased during that period of time. Our overall population in the state, general population of the state, increased by 4 percent. <laughs> Something's wrong there. I, you don't have to be a statistician, a statistician to realize that there's really something wrong there. At the same time, as we were getting tougher and tougher on crime, violent crime kept going up. I mean, you think that you got really, really tough on crime, you see it just plummet. Well, it didn't. We got tough on crime, violent crime kept going up. Just gradually, not all day, but it kept going up. We got tougher on crime, and it kept going up. No impact on it, just kept going up all those several decades. So there was something wrong here. And, um, and I started to look at this and see what, what were the causes of it. And we, we, we found a couple things. We, I held, we held a hearing on the death penalty some years ago, about a decade ago, and, um, and on capital punishment. And it uh, was done because one of my members had asked me to do it, and I had voted for all the capital punishments. I voted to reinstate capital punishment. I voted to change the way we executed people by lethal injection, but I still supported it. Uh, I held the hearing because we wanted to discuss the issue, but I thought that was a closed issue. Um, and when we did that, um, we found that many of the opponents of capital punishment were saying that we had convicted innocent people. And I didn't believe that because I knew I was in the, when I was in the DA's office, I knew we thoroughly investigated those cases and that I would be shocked if we had ever had done that. Well, they said, we'll pass a, a uh, bill on, um, on uh, DNA testing and we'll show you. Because if you can show that, I mean, that's proves beyond all doubt, not reasonable doubt, all doubt that the person is innocent if DNA is a important part of the, of the, uh, right. sure. of the prosecution. So we did, we pa passed that bill and within three years we found, or more, we found that we had one person on death row that was innocent, two people who were serving life imprisonment and others that were serving very long sentences for rape or other, other uh, crimes. So that, that shook me terribly because that was not justice. I mean, not, there's a saying our founding fathers used it, that it's uh, better to acquit a few guilty people than to convict one innocent person, and I believe that, and so I was not justice, and even one person. Some people say, well, that's the cost of justice. It is not the cost of justice. Not one person. That should shake us when we have one person was convicted, and I, I, I could not let that go. So I started to look at how we could readjust these laws that we passed to make them apply to for make sure we have public safety but at the same time avoid 
these injustices, the ultimate injustices in convicting an innocent person. And um, so we looked at that, and I, I didn't know what was causing it. How did we do that? And um, so we developed relationships with some of the, the medical, the, the law schools, and, and a professor of, chem, of uh, criminal law, and start to hold hearings on this. I thought, well, this is the way. Let's find out. Let's bring all the experts in, everybody, and see what they come up with. And they came up with reasons for it. It's the way we conduct our our. our um, our lineups is important when you identify eyewitness identification. Um, and it's not intentional on anyone's part. These, uh, these things are just subtle things that, uh, look, I'm a lawyer and I know you try to build your case, try to help your witnesses and clarify their thinking and, let their, and, and help them with their, what they're going to face in the courtroom and things like that. And, what happened was inadvertently sometimes that happened and during uh, eyewitness identification. I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a nationally known case in, um, in North Carolina where the co-ed was, uh, was uh, in her dorm and she was attacked and during that attack she, and, and rape she was told and she kept saying to herself I'm, I'm going to remember this guy and I'm going to identify him and she made a great effort to remember every part of his uh, face and, and to make the identification. Afterwards, she was shown um, a um, what they call an array. It's a photographs, and she picked out one person. And she said, "That's kind of I think that's what I think it is him, but I'm not sure. But I think it's, it looks like him." And uh, then later, the same um, investigating officer took her to pick out an individual in the lineup. And she picked the same one out, and she said, I think it's this guy. And he said, well, he's the same guy you picked at the, at the photo array. At that point, just that little coaching, it was, it was an innocent thing, turned her mind, and all of a sudden, that was the guy. She never wavered from that day on. And that's why we need a double, what they call double-blind uh, identification uh, to deal with that issue so that there's not a temptation to do that so that um, that doesn't happen. The same with uh, confessions, so we need to have them recorded. And all this is forensic has been shown that this, this helps. So, so we're in the process of trying to get the best, their best practices. They'll help law enforcement, the better case will be better. It doesn't help to convict an innocent person and take that um, and have, make sure we have the person who's actually committed the crime. So um, we'd start with that, and then, then we'd get back to the, the long answer to your question, then we get into prison reform, because at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we have that, uh, realize that punishment without rehabilitation is a failure. And we can be tough on crime, but we have to be smart about it. So how can we be smart and help to rehabilitate the individuals we put in our prisons. Because that was the purpose of it. It wasn't all punishment. It was to make them, because they all come out, except for life imprisonment individuals. So when they come back out, we had a 60% recidivism rate. That's not good. It's, it's wasteful. And so we were adding, as I mentioned, the statistics, adding tremendous numbers of people to our prisons every year. 2,000 to peak, we're adding, two, a few years ago, we're adding 2,000 new inmates a year added on to the, so we were up to 51,000, and then that following year we had 53, and if it kept on, it would be, the next year it would be 55, and on and on, and we had to do things to stop that. I'm willing to pay that money and incarcerate that money if it worked. It wasn't working, and because we had no rehabilitation efforts on, on this, and that's important. We can save their lives, then they become protective citizens. If we don't, they come out and they commit more crimes. So it's a public safety issue as well, because mm -hmm. they're going. To, so um, and we've so that's why I got involved in that issue. We're we're working on that. We've passed legislation in regard to that about reentry programs and all, and uh, a lot of other reforms that we don't have time to talk about. But um, we're well on our way of doing that, and other states are doing it as well. Um, you mentioned some of the other bills that you've passed, but you have some very recognizable bills passed, like the Clean Indoor Air Act, the Megan's Law, uh, you mentioned the No Means No Rape, rape Law, um, the Puppy Lemon Law. I mean, there are some big, big pieces of legislation that you've passed um, that have your authorship on them. 
Um, uh, I'll leave it open to you to discuss any, any or all of those and what significance they've had over the years and uh, are they continuing to, to work? Well, again, if you look at that record, you think, oh, what is he doing? I mean, he's all over the issue. He's tough on crime. He's dealing with uh, animal cruelty and then child, child cruelty and, and clean air and smoking issues. And I said, what's the, what's the, the tying factor is a justice issue. It's like, and so some of them are considered liberal issues, some of them are considered conservative issues. It, right. it doesn't really matter to me. I, don't, I think if we limit ourselves to that, uh, it, as a legislator particularly, you're, you're harming your self-effectiveness here and, 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 and representing and how you represent your constituents because if we're trying to do justice and if we do justice then we're doing the best thing for our constituency. So all those bills all had their origin with that, the, the, smoke, the, the, the Clean in, Indoor Air Act. I mean, the, our Constitution says that we uh, have the right, as a uh, people of Pennsylvania, to uh, have um, uh, clean air, as well as water and, and, and other and, and land. And um, I don't advocate excessively interfering with a person's choices. They can do things that are, you know, we can overeat, or we can, you know, we can smoke, we can do those things. And if it doesn't impact someone else, <clears throat> I, I generally stay away from that. So it's not, I wasn't advocating for stopping that people can't smoke, like prohibition. It doesn't work. You, you have to right. persuade people and show them the facts and the health issues and consequences. So that, that law, um, uh, some of these bills, you have to be very um, perseverant in, in, in pursuing them because when you introduce them, they're not always popular or supported by the public uh, or supported, certainly supported by the legislature. Sometimes they're supported by the public and not supported by the, uh, uh, the legislature. But it's all about advocacy and perseverance. Uh, you can't force things on people. You have to educate them, and that's what I try to do. And that legislation took probably 10 to 15 years to pass. But what happened is the, the, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States kept issuing reports every few years about the dangers of secondary smoke. And that's all it does. It just says in indoor smoking, you, you, you can't subject other people to a, to a substance that can cause um, cardiac uh, re response or cancer or other, other things. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a high carcinogen that's recognized by the uh, EPA as being such secondary smoke. So that was passed and I, I'm really happy about that and clear because it has had an impact. There's some, there's, uh, one, one lesson I learned in the legislature is that not only being perseverance, but also being recognized that you don't always get everything that you want because you have to compromise. Everybody has different views. And I, I learned that issue when I introduced a bill once on um, 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 dog uh, fighting. There used to be a, a process where they would put two pit bulls in a pit and they would fight out to the death. That didn't seem like a thing that we should condone. So I introduced the legislation to, uh, to stop it. And um, I thought nobody would be opposed to this. Well, there was. And they had a lobbyist and they had the, all, all the things. So, you know, you always say there's, there's always another side to every story. And you have to understand that. And sometimes when you introduce something, you may not get everything. There was one issue I was dealing with was no, uh, the uh, open records law. Right. I advocated that for years. And, um, well, before we just recently passed the, the right, revisions. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Governor Ridge called me. I, I'd been fighting for that for a long time. Governor Ridge called me and offered me and said, look, if you would, if you would compromise on this and give a lesser bill, oh, I think we could get it passed and would you sponsor it? And I said, no, I, I want the whole, all the protections. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, someone else introduced it, it passed, it became the law, and now, 10 years later, all the things I wanted have been amended in it slowly over the years. <laughs> so I learned that in the, uh, in the Clean Air Indoor Air Act. That was the next one. 
And so there is exceptions to that bill, but it's only but 95% or more of the other places we go into now are smoke free. That was a big advancement, a big victory. When yeah, no, we didn't get the casinos and some of the bars and things like that, but you know, we can get that later as we did on the, on the other legislation. So one of the things you'll learn as a legislator, and you should learn as a legislator, and it took me a little bit longer than some others, is to accept what you can get and then fight for it continually, can fight for it no more. Because once it's accepted, then the opponents are on the losing end of that. Because once they accept it, then people realize the benefits of it and the dangers of it, and they'll want more. So that's my theory. It may take many years afterwards, but so that was one of them. So I've been involved in consumer issues uh, there um, to like the public Levin law and uh, and I've been an advocate for the um, for the uh, uh, the, um, the the uh, lemon uh, lemon automobiles and that sort of a thing. So I've, I've introduced legislation on that as well. So consumer issues, um, people who don't have the, the the power themselves, like children. There's no lobbyists for children up to that point, and now there's more of a lobby for them. Uh, same with the uh, women who have been abused and, and assaulted. Um, again. Uh, there is a lobby for them, but uh, it was something that was hard to, to get uh, through. Um, so, well, you can measure uh, success in a different in different ways as being a successful legislator. Uh, legislatively, uh, I think we calculated almost somewhere almost 150 bills or acts of pieces of legislation have been in law you have enacted. I've had your authorship. Um, do you see that? How do you see that in terms of uh, being a main aim of a legislator, uh, it, uh, taking the legislative end, having that many pieces of legislation as law versus, like you said, putting a heavy reliance on constituent service. Um, and I, why don't as many other people have that many pieces of legislation enacted? I, I think it's important to, uh, to, to do both as best you can. And, um, and if you're advocating for changes in our society and to make it a more just society, then there's going to be bills, hopefully, that you can pass uh, that accomplish that. But that's not the only way you can do that. You can do that through advocacy, just, just what you advocate for. I think sometimes um, that the legislation now, I've come to the conclusion that sometimes the legislation is not as important. It's important, but not as important as public attitude. Or if you're dealing with an agency like the criminal justice system or Department of Corrections or the courts or other agencies, if they change their attitude, you don't need the legislation. Now, the legislation establishes permanency to that change. But if I had my choice between the two, I think I'd probably choose the change in attitude because I know that would be systemic. The change would be systemic. The legislation, you're trying to force them to do something they don't want to do. So I really just think, I said that recently to a legislative conference recently, I don't think they liked it so much because it kind of diminished what they were doing and diminishes what I'm trying to do. But I'm not saying legislation isn't important. It is important. Right. But, it, but and it helps to change public attitude. That's what it does more than anything. Because you can pass a law and no one will bother with it or care about it. So um, I think that that's is, is more, more important. But what you do in your district is extremely, extremely important. It's at least 50 percent, or as, as much. It's as equally as important mm -hmm. because people should walk into a district office, and some of them have, and you just watch what goes on in the district office and a legislator, and they'll see what kind of help they're providing for people. That's that's as rewarding or more rewarding than passing a piece of legislation. What either, you, from the legislation that you've passed, or maybe some of the issues that we're dealing with now, some of the major issues, pension reform, um, uh, transportation reform, things like that, what do you find are the hardest issues for you to either vote on or, or create policy around or legislation around? Well, we're dealing with these days very, very controversial issues. And there's no winner in some of these. And, some of, and sometimes we're, again, doing the same thing that we were doing and I was doing in, in, in law enforcement is the unintended consequences. It's a good bill. It's a, it looks like it's a good bill, but there's some unintended consequences could make it worse. 
or 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 just as bad or or it's just we have to be careful about what we pass because it looks good. Oh, oh, we dealt with that issue when we really didn't. It's going to make the situation worse or it doesn't help much. And, and I think that's the hardest thing that we're dealing with. And, and then to talk about people and convince our fellow legislators and also the public that we've we got to be careful what we pass because it's all, the, the, the desire is to pass something really fast and, and say we passed it, and it's not malicious, it's not intentional, it's just that, well, we won't, well the answer to this question is this, it's always this, and we have to think out the box, it may not be this, it may be something that we need to take a little bit of time to figure this out, what's causing it. I think, it, I think uh, a classic example of that was, was, was child, um, where, where juveniles and the, the violence going on in our, in our society, the uh, co Columbine, oh, right. when that happened. I remember the first reaction was from all, from all, particularly from the House, I think it was, but the Senate too, let's pass tougher laws on juveniles, let's put them all in jail. Well, that wasn't the reason. The reason was for bullying was the reason for this. It doesn't justify what they do, but if we want to try to stop it, you don't put everybody in jail because then we destroy the juvenile justice system. That would have done that. And then a lot of kids that did a minor infraction, you're right. going to get really tough with them. You're going to put them in a detention center. And that many have destroyed, we've now found that they, that destroys their lives because you've taken them out of their natural progression and their children. They, they're not, they cannot rebound as, as easy. Like the one young man in, in uh, Luzerne County who was a wrestler going to college, <clears throat> some judge, um, Put him, in, put him in a detention center for a year and he could never recover himself. He committed suicide. <clears throat> we have to be careful about, about, thing, about things like that. Well, the, legisl the legislature itself has been in a state of reform the last yes. few years. Um, do you believe the reforms and the changes in, in, that we have seen in the House rules and, and, and whatnot, are, are they working? And are, is there anything out there uh, proposals out there that you would want to see enacted right. to help even more. Right. To I, even I more. mean, I'm, I think transparency is important and change of attitude. I mean, we have d d adopted almost every rule we can think of, both in the House and the Senate, to uh, to give guidance. And it's important to also give guidance. And, I mean, some of them are pretty obvious what you shouldn't be doing. Some of them are not. It's in gray areas, and we should give as much guidance to the legislators as possible. Uh, and support them and have someone that we can have available to us that that can bounce off this idea well what do you think about this and that that's just as important and then the change of attitude uh, up here is also important that's again as, as important as what we've done about changing the rules uh, how has the advent of uh, technology affected the way you've uh, either done your job or reached out to your constituents or have legislated. Right. Uh, we get emails, you're constantly right. in contact with your constituents. Right. How has that changed the way you've done business? Oh, I love it. I lo I'm not good at it, <laughs> but, uh, but I love it. You know, I mean, anyone my age or around my age, they're not good at it. Actually, you have to be probably, I don't, like, like, I don't know what it is, but even my grandson, um, you know, is, is good at it. He knows how to do it. He showed me one time how to do this. Look, you're doing this wrong. You had to do this, you know. Okay. He's three years old. Um, uh, so that, but, but that, that um, change has been tremendous because it's all about transparency. If you're good, doing a good job and you're doing your job and you're advocating for issues like this, then you love this because you can communicate with them easy, in an easier way. I mean, most of, the, most of the correspondence that we get are not by hard mail, but by emails. Right. And um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. If you have a good story to tell, and the legislature has a good story to tell, they, they can watch them on TV. I was an advocate for that, to open up those, uh, those um, uh, establish the uh, PCN and the other other agencies that uh, you put it on your website now, you can stream them or what do whatever, whatever those things are. Absolutely. And um, that's, that's, we have a good story to tell. And when people watch what we do, it's not pretty. I mean, what's the saying says that making laws like a kind making of sausage. Like, like, like sausage. It's not pretty, yeah. but it's democracy. Yeah. And it's, it's better, better to argue it and fight it out 
on the, the Senate and the House floor than to do it out in the streets. Because what we're doing is we're resolving the, the, the disputes among in society. And that's what we're doing. When we're debating those issues and the majority in our democracy, a majority wins that particular point for now. It can be changed if you have the support for it. So um, the technology, I think, is wonderful. It's helped us to, it's less, it does, it's less expensive. Uh, you have immediate, immediate contact with your constituent. So we're trying to use every form possible to communicate with them and let them know what we're doing because democracy is based on transparency and educating the, the people that you represent. They cannot vote, they cannot advocate or discuss issues unless they are, they're informed and they're, they can intelligently discuss those issues and give us input. We need that input from them. We don't, I don't want to be passing things that are not good for our, our society and my constituents and sometimes they point out things that I would not know. So it's a real, that, that communication helps democracy, doesn't hurt it. Uh, we've also had an influx, um, and I'll leave it up to you to determine if it's good or bad, but of, of uh, a lot of turnover, especially in the House, a little bit in the Senate. Um, uh, do you believe uh, having, uh, some, of, some people have said that has caused some type of di division within uh, uh, the caucuses or the, the House in general, and the, or the legislature in general, and has caused a gridlock. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I know, I think I read somewhere you're not necessarily in favor of term limits, uh, but what, um, uh, having that uh, turnover, is that a good thing and has that really caused the gridlock in that, that we're seeing? No, I think it's a good thing and I, the reason I don't support uh, term limits is we, all, we have that turnover in a natural way. I've talked to other legislators where they've had term limits and the people that end up having the most influence then is the staff and the lobbyists because they're the only ones that have institutional knowledge and know what's going on and how to effectuate change. It takes a while for you to understand how to do that and, um, and we have um, a natural change if that if not everybody's been in the legislature as long as I have the average stay is about 10 years I think in different chambers and um, and and so and it's not destructive because it's a it's a gradual random change. It's almost like somebody went there and here, you, you, and you, and you are going to retire. But that's not what happens. So they, they, they either they, you know, they have all reasons why people leave. You know, uh, they lose election, they decide to retire. There's just many, many reasons why they leave. And I don't think people realize how, just how many leave every year, uh, every, every two years, every election season. So I think it's, I, I don't think it's destructive at all. I think it's a, a natural process that we should let play out. I mean, we have as many as five or six senators that leave on one time, and this is on a two-year cycle. That's a lot out of 50. Yeah. And every, every two years, that's, that's, that's quite a bit. And uh, because the other, other problem is that when you have the term limits, they're, they're all, I've talked to them, they're all looking to their next election somewhere else because they know they're not going to be there for eight years or wherever it is, and so it's very destructive. They're here, it's a voluntary process in which they go through that, and it's, it's, I think it's very helpful to the legislature to have that new blood come in. The problem is, of course, that they have to learn all the process, but that's okay. That's, that sh we should not keep it static for that reason. That's, that's an, it's a, just a natural process. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, have you ever thought about running for uh, another office until I found that you did. Yes. I uh, ran for a congressional seat yes. in, in 2000. Yes. Um, what was that experience like for you? And, and have you given thought to ever doing it again? Yeah. I like my job, and, and that was, uh, I did try to do that. And um, it's, it's the same process, it's just a little bit more, more people. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's double, or a little bit more than double a Senate seat. And so um, and I'm glad I had the experience. And, um, but I, you know, I, I love being in the state Senate and, um, and, I, and I love, you know, having an impact if I, whatever impact I can have here. Another interesting note that I came upon in 2011, you put yourself on the presidential ballot in New Hampshire. Right. Well, what was, what was the basis behind that? Well, you know, I'm all about issues, right? right? If, 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 if you've gotten that, I think mm -hmm. you've gotten that out of it maybe at that point. 
Um, and I was thinking, of, we're looking at our economy and saying, what, what are we going to do? Uh, how, what would turn our economy around? What would help to restart our economy? And I came up with a no number of ideas, and I conveyed them to different officials and all, and they, they kind of gave me lip service and kind of brushed me away and said, okay, look, you're a state senator. You don't know anything about it. They didn't say that to me, but it was, I tried. And, um, and so I decided, you know, the only way I could get these issues out, this help is to, is to file in, in New Hampshire, and, and then I'll have the reason to have a national platform and sure. discuss those issues. And so I did do that, and I put together a TV uh, commercial, and we ran it all over New Hampshire, um, and I was up there discussing it, and, um, and it was all about uh, our dollar and, and how weakened it's become, and it's not backed by anything other than the promise and good faith of the United States government, mm -hmm. which sometimes financially doesn't look too responsible. Um, I'm, I mean, we're, I'm not poking fun at them, but yeah. you know, we have problems here in Pennsylvania too, but we have to have a balanced budget, they don't. Sure. So, um, and there was, I had some ideas about how to, how to boost, uh, reinforce and support and collateralize our, our, our uh, dollar. Uh, because if our dollar fails, and it fails to be accepted internationally, then we're in trouble because it is an international currency. And it's just even now, today, it shows signs that they're not going to accept it. And then protecting our intellectual property, one of the few things that we have in the country is no one can compete with us as intellectual property and our educational systems. Um, that's, uh, no one can compete with Pennsylvania on, on the number of colleges we have and the, uh, and the academic uh, strength that we have here. They can't steal that. You know, they can't imitate that. They try, and I'm glad that they do, but we have to protect that. That's, we can't just treat that as some uh, thing that's maybe, that's not of value. It's of tremendous value. And so was other issues, but there are the, a couple of them. Did, uh, you, did you see it then as a successful enterprise, as an exercise? I, th I thought so. I, I thought so. I mean, we got, was, was on talk, some talk radio shows, uh, some TV, and I said oh, we had a TV ad. And, um, and um, so, you know, all I can do is advocate and try. And I, I thought, you know, I've gotten constituents since then have said, well, what are you doing about our economy? What are we doing? I said, well, I can say I did do something about our economy. I tried. Sure. You know, I tried to get a national uh, platform and, and, and educate people about what are some of the things that I think we could do. Do you have any um, uh, regrets or disappointments looking back on your career um, uh, that maybe a piece of legislation you, you thought you have uh, should have gotten or, or any, anything else that yeah. well the, the legislation I haven't passed yet I'm still working on I, I, I'm not I'm not disappointed about that at all that's just perseverance and patience and advocacy um, and and the the concerns that I have and the regrets I might have about legislation is in the law enforcement area that we just talked about right. about the fact is that we, we we have to watch out what the unintended consequences are and we constantly do it we're still doing it I mean and I'll, now I'm now saying let's look at this legislation and let's see what the unintended consequences are pass it for that particular purpose but make sure that we don't have have um, side effects that we're not intending to have, or it's too broad. And so that's the, I, I'm, we learned through our through processes, and, and, and um, that's one of the lessons, as I've indicated, that I learned. Uh, you've received numerous awards and recognitions over the, over the years. What, what place does that hold for you? How do you view those? Well, they're nice, but um, I, I, and I, and I, I certainly respect the individuals and groups that, that may have given me something like that, um, but uh, it's, I don't spend a lot of time on that because it's not helping my constituents uh, uh, and, and it's not making any, any changes. So if it gives me some credibility to accomplish that purpose, then yes. But the, the award itself is, is you know, it's, um, it's fine, but it's not something I dwell on. Um, what advice would you give either uh, someone, a young person, or someone looking to get in uh, the political sphere or becoming a public official? What would you tell them? 
Well, I'd encourage them to do that because democracy is based on that. People that would be interested in doing it at every level on all types. It doesn't have to be an elected official. It can be an appointed official. It can be involved in, your, in different agencies and groups and committees in your township or your county or in the state or federal level. Um, most of the offices are not elected officials. They are people who are volunteered. And also to run for a public, public office. But just, just know that's hard work, and, and, and you have to decide whether you really want to do this. And if you do, then do it, and you can be successful. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a hard, time-consuming process, but it's worth it because you can make a change for the better. Uh, what's next for, for Senator Greenleaf? Where, where do you foresee your legislative career going? Right. Well, I have a whole slew of ideas I'm working on <laughs> right now. You know, human trafficking, I just had a hearing on, uh, that's what I love about being the committee chair, I can hold hearings on the bills I've introduced, and this one was on about how we treat and, and um, people who have a, um, drug and alcohol addictions, and the tr we have to treat it as a chronic disease, not as a habit, because there is physiological changes in people's bodies when they are addicted to a substance, and we have to recognize that and have approach it as a medical condition, not as a, a, a habit, right. for example. That's one thing. And I'm still dealing with some juvenile justice issues now um, in regard to making sure that we don't harm children more than, I mean, most of them are not, are not violent offenders or something in the public safety. There are issues concerning truancy or runaways, and we shouldn't be putting them in jail for that and, and giving them the rights that they, you know, they're children and they can be rehabilitated more so than adults, uh, that sort of a thing. And I think the property tax issue is all very, very important. And the economy, um, all those issues are on my plate and um, I'm active in all of them. How would you want your tenure as a public servant to be remembered? That I did justice. Period. I think that sums it up very well. Yes. Um, I don't have anything else. Okay, and thank you so I, much. I really appreciate you coming in and talking yeah, to us. Thank you so much for doing this. This is awesome that you do this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Because my, my service in the House was really important to me. I, I, even though I spent only a two years there, I think about it often. I don't, I don't really d differentiate between the two. Even though I only spent two years there and 30 some years right. in the Senate, I, I don't look at them differently. They were still impactful on me and hopefully and I think all that, my Yeah, I think I got that sense about yeah. it didn't matter what chamber you were in or no. what really. And no. You take the opportunity, whatever the opportunity yeah. you have, and use it. And I had an opportunity there. I had an opportunity in local government and the DA's office and other places, and you just take opportunities to use it. So thank you. Thank you, sir.